Uh, I am going to pass it over uh, to uh, one of our speakers today. Uh, Dave Reynolds is an RVP uh, in our South Central region. Uh, so that covers you know, Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, down in that part of the country. And uh, he, he's an excellent value to our summer training camp series because lots of experience and particularly kind of in these kind of sales concepts and case designs, a, a wealth of experience that we get to tap into today. So I'm really excited for it. Hope you guys enjoy it. Dave, the floor is yours. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Kyle. And again, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to participate today. Early on in my career, it's hard to believe I've been in this business for over 30 years. I recognized I wanted to work with business owners. Because daytime work, they don't waste your time. If you can convince them what you're presenting makes sense, they'll pull the trigger. And why focus on selective benefits or non-qualified executive benefits is your business owner clients work hard to build a successful business. Now they want to make sure it remains successful. A key asset to any business is quality employees. Those talented employees who are as committed to the business as the owners. Attracting those people and then motivating, retaining, and rewarding them is critical to business planning. Equally important is making sure as a business owner they reward themselves. So one of the key problems facing business owners and their key employees is what we call the income gap. Traditional qualified programs, even combined with Social Security, fall short of providing the retirement income needed to support the lifestyle a business owner and their key employees have worked hard to achieve. This retirement draft, uh, gap could drive the best employees to competitors offering more lucrative retirement plans. What happens when a key employee leaves for a competitor? Customers and possibly other key employees leave with them. This impacts sales, employee morale, and ultimately lower job satisfaction. So smaller employers can offer the same types or very similar non-qualified executive benefit plans as their large employers. One of the things at Global Atlantic that I don't think we promote enough is we have, without a doubt, one of the best advanced planning teams in the industry. We have Randy Zipsy. He's an estate planning hall of fame member. Lena Storm, who Randy and Lena have built the design hub, which if you've not looked at it or used for a presentation, is a, as powerful a presentation tool as I've seen out there. David Graham, who will be presenting tomorrow, runs our Coley division. Jason Van Santi is one of the best I've ever worked with in the premium finance space. And we have Pam Livingston, who's there to support you if you run into foreign national cases. But this team is led by our next presenter, Bill Crane, Crane, the head of our dream team. Bill, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate that very much. And first of all, I want to thank everyone who is joining and, and let you know that we're thinking about you during these tough times. There's certainly a lot of challenges right now for people around the country and the world, and insurance producers are, are facing that as much, if not more, than, than everyone else. So, we're thinking about you, hope you're doing well physically and financially, and, and know we're here to help you. As Dave mentioned, my name is Bill Crane. I, I run the advanced sales team at Global Atlantic, and my responsibilities include oversight of the, the Coley, or corporate owned life insurance team. And we see a great deal of potential here all along the spectrum from small businesses to large businesses and, and all those in between. So as many of you know, at the end of 2017, the federal government slashed uh, tax rates on C corporations to a very low rate of 21%, well below the, the top personal tax rate of 37%. And with a tax rate this low, C corps are looking for opportunities to retain earnings, and life insurance can be a great solution. So it's important to know that C corporations that accumulate earnings instead of distributing uh, them as dividends to shareholders are subject to excise tax on annual retained earnings above $250,000. However, like most rules, there are exceptions, and the exceptions here are critical. One such exception uh, includes when a corporation uses life insurance uh, for a business continuation plan, uses those earnings to fund life insurance, such as the, per the purchase of a key person insurance policy. So a great solution for your business owners. So along with coverage to protect the company in the event of the death of a key executive, the policy may also be utilized to provide valuable benefits to those executives. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And 
probably there's a lot of benefits of, of life insurance, but cost recovery, the ability down the road, long term to recoup uh, much, uh, if not all of the money that's, that's paid out for these plans is really a great benefit. We're going to talk more of that, more about that today. So just to give you the rundown, I'm going to talk about uh, what executive uh, benefits are, non-qualified executive benefits are, why they're important to your clients, uh, the types of them. I'm going to hand it, hand it back over to my friend Dave Reynolds to discuss a real life example. Uh, then we'll wrap up with a case study and, uh, and take your questions, of course. So one thing I wanna note before we jump into the presentation is ERISA. Um, that, can be a, that can be a scary word for a lot of people. Um, this is a 101 session. ERISA is complex, so I'm not gonna go into it in detail, but I have to mention it um, because it clearly applies to these plans. And um, it's important to know that if, if the plan, the non-qualified executive benefit plan is, is for a group of a select group of management or highly compensated employees, also known as a top hat plan, most ERISA requirements are not required. So, you know, that's typically the market we're in for white collar executives for which much of the ERISA requirements are, 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 are not required. And we can help you um, address that when you're, when you're working through these plans. Of course, you should always work with, uh, with counsel as well. But I wanted to get that out of the way. I know that's probably something on, on the top of your mind. You'll hear me talk about executives uh, throughout, this, throughout this presentation, and that's specifically tailored to address this because when you're talking about highly compensated executives, a lot of those regulations don't apply, and that's important. So um, this disclaimer, always important. Um, we're gonna talk about tax a little bit today. So I wanna read this to you. This presentation is based on our current understanding of applicable tax laws, regulations, and rulings, and it's subject to change. Neither the company nor its agents provide legal or tax advice. Clients should always seek the opinion of their own legal or tax advisor prior to any transaction. This material is not intended to be used and cannot be used to avoid tax penalties. It was prepared to support the promotion or marketing of the matter addressed in this document. All right, so what are non-qualified executive benefit plans? I'll also refer to it um, by uh, NQEB, just to make things a little, a little shorter since it's a long phrase during this presentation. So very simply, it's an arrangement between an employer and an employee, uh, usually a, a high uh, wage earning executive, to pay future benefits for services performed today. So via this arrangement, the employer makes a promise to pay the executive at some future date. Now to understand non-qualified benefits, it's important to discuss qualified benefits uh, briefly, and Dave touched on this in the beginning. So in many situations, qualified plans and social security benefits along with personal savings uh, can provide significant retirement for many employees in our great solutions. However, this combination is unfortunately uh, generally not adequate for highly compensated executives, uh, due in part to the uh, contribution limits for qualified plans, uh, income taxes on what executives can save on an after-tax basis, um, maximum Social Security benefits that, that typically represent only a small percentage of the executive's total need. Even if an employer has a qualified plan in place, a non-qualified executive benefit plan should be considered for these executives. Uh, it's a great complement and supplement to qualified plans. And that typically is the case that there is a qualified plan already in place, and this is a supplement. Um, qualified plans must provide benefits for all or most employees. <clears throat> um, you know, employers find these uh, obviously essential for maintaining a committed workforce. Um, however, a non-qualified plan um, can be tailored to, uh, to a group of executives or even a single executive. So no need here to extend all of these benefits to rank and file employees. They, these can be tailored specifically for one or several executives. So that's important to know. So why should your clients, your business clients, consider these plans? Um, you know, today's employers are challenged a lot, especially recently. Uh, but a key concern um, is always retaining top executives, right? We all know how important it is to 
recruit and retain uh, great employees. It makes all the difference in the world for, uh, for our businesses. So um, these highly compensated executives, uh, as we discussed, are, are faced with that challenge of saving enough for retirement due to the modest income of Social Security and limits on qualified plans. And having enough retirement income is obviously a top concern for many Americans. Now, a non-qualified executive plan can provide that attractive or those attractive supplemental retirement benefits to executives who have maxed out their qualified plans. It, it can be a much needed incentive by which an employer can uh, attract and retain these individuals. Now, we talked about cost recovery. I mentioned that briefly. And there is potential in these plans, um, typically when you're using life insurance, for cost recovery. And again, that means that all or some of the money that the employer put into the plan, including the life insurance premiums, uh, may be recovered when the plan is fulfilled uh, at the death of the executive. Obviously, a huge benefit. We're going to go through the illustration software and show um, you know, what that looks like. Um, you can run these supplements as well to show your client you know, what their cost recovery could be at the end of the plan. Now, um, you know, it must be structured properly. It's, of course, not guaranteed um, through, through an index universal and most life insurance uh, policies. Uh, these plans are also very long term, so usually 20 to 40 years. Um, the, the lifespan of, of an executive, you know, typically between 40 and 60 years old. So they're only for companies that have long term plans and plan to be in business for multiple generations. So, again, we'll look at that in, in a moment. Other benefits for the employer include that the employer has complete control over these plans. They have complete control over the life insurance and the cash value. Uh, the life insurance cash value, of course, accumulates income tax deferred, as you're all aware, and benefits paid to the executives are tax deductible to the employer. Hey, Bill. So, yep. Bill, we had a question. Um, is just just limited to executives or are are business owners able to do this you know on themselves that was one of the questions we got in oh yes yes for sure you can yeah business owners can definitely do this on themselves and um it can have a lot of a lot of great benefits as well so absolutely when i'm talking about executives i should include owner employees because yes you can definitely use these plans with great success on yourself. So here on this slide, we have um, six different types of non-qualified executive benefits. We're going to very briefly go through um, each one of these. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time or detail uh, on all of these, but I wanna give you a sense of what they look like. So probably the most common one that we see is called a SERP or Supplemental Executive Retirement Plan. And this generally provides defined benefit payments for executives over a period of, say, five to 20 years in, in, in retirement. Now, they're very similar to qualified pension plans where employers pay for most, if not all, of the cost of, this, of these benefits. The employer will agree to pay retirement benefits that are either in a set amount or a formula. The life insurance policy will then fund the benefits promised by the employer and may provide that cost recovery I mentioned, at least to some extent, at the executive's death. So at the end, when we look at a, a case study, we're going to look at a, at a SERP. We'll look at this type of design. So because the benefit is defined, um, it doesn't fluctuate necessarily. It, these are very attractive to executive employees. Uh, this presentation is not meant to be an advertisement for, for Global Atlantic, uh, but certainly using an IUL with downside protection eliminates uh, some of the risk to the employer and allows the employer to be more comfortable when offering a defined benefit plan um, like a SERP that's funded by life insurance uh, due to those downside protections. So that's kind of our value statement uh, in the Coley market is when you use an IUL, uh, you have that downside protection and that provides more comfort for employers. And we, we've seen that a lot recently with the market fluctuating so much that our clients who purchased an IUL 
rather than a variable, variable policy or some other investment like a mutual fund to fund their plans, um, we're very happy. They, they, they were more at ease um, during all the fluctuations. Another very common plan is deferred compensation. So rather than a defined benefit like in a SERP, uh, this is a defined contribution plan in which the executive defers a specific amount, um, but does not know the amount that they will have at retirement. Um, similar in many ways to a 401k plan, but without the limits, of course. So typically the executive will defer a set amount or percentage of future income. The executive may also choose to defer a, a bonus in the future, all or, or, or a percentage of it. The deferred income may create an interest rate specified in the deferral agreement, but there's flexibility there. And the deferred amounts and interest are paid to the executive over a specified period of time, such as retirement or in the event of a disability. The executive is usually fully vested in the deferrals and is entitled to them when they separate from service. A plan that's pretty simple to administer is a death benefit only plan or DBO. Death benefit only plans typically do not require executive contributions. So the important part is, is in lieu of a retirement benefit like you'd see in a SERP or a deferred compensation, there's a survivor benefit that's promised to the executive's beneficiary at the executive's death, um, whether the executive is still employed or, or in retirement. So as you can imagine, these plans work very well with life insurance because you're paying, paying a death benefit. So life insurance is almost exclusively used for these plans. Um, an agreement between the employer and executive specifies the conditions that must be met for benefit payments to begin, as well as the amount, frequency, duration of those payments. Next one is a split SERP. So this approach combines two non-qualified executive benefits um, to provide both a SERP retirement benefit, which we discussed earlier, uh, as well as a pre-retirement tax-free death benefit to the executive's beneficiaries, and that's via a split dollar agreement. So an employer-owned life insurance policy is used to provide a death benefit to the executive's beneficiaries that is paid in the event of the executive's death prior to retirement. So using this method, the endorsed amount of death benefit will be received by the beneficiaries, the executive's beneficiaries, free of income tax. So that's where the split dollar agreement comes in. In order for that death benefit to be income tax free, the executive will have to pay taxes on the economic benefit. So the economic benefit is equal, without going into too much detail, is equal to the amount of the death benefit uh, multiplied by a term insurance cost. And that's taken from the IRS table 2001 or a company's alternative term rate. So basically it's, it's the value of that life insurance coverage based largely on term rates. And then the uh, executive would pay a tax based on their tax rate on that amount. And that amount is gonna be significantly less than the annual premium. Um, the employer will then retain the balance of the death benefit proceeds to offset its plan expense. So for this plan, you have both a SERP agreement, um, which covers retirement, and a separate endorsement split dollar agreement um, that would cover pre-retirement, and they'll need to be completed by the employer and the executive. That split dollar agreement will terminate if not used. Um, if, in other words, if the executive survives to retirement, that split dollar agreement terminates, and the SERP agreement then kicks in and the SERP agreement will provide those retirement benefits at retirement as discussed earlier. Another one is a 401k lookalike plan. So as you might have guessed from its name, it's very similar uh, to a salary deferral and employer matching strategy used in a qualified 401k plan, but again without the contribution limits. So pursuant to the agreement, the executive defers a portion of current income. The executive is at all times fully vested in the deferred amount. The employer may contribute a predetermined amount or percentage of deferral annually. The executive will vest in this matching contribution according to a vesting schedule. Now, typically, if you're 
a client is wanting to implement a 401k lookalike plan um, and, and they want to use insurance in order to fund it, um, typically they're going to use a variable policy where you have those dif those investment strategy options. So that's typically what uh, what we'll see. So so at Global Atlantic, at least we don't we don't do many 401k lookalike plans. I can't remember us ever doing one, which uh, which makes sense. Uh, finally, I wanted to put in this last example, executive bonus. Um, this is different than than all of the others, um, but I thought it was important just to highlight it because it is very common um, and and very simple. Uh, it's different from the first five types because in these arrangements, the executive owns the policy, not the employer. So the employer is giving up a lot of control. I mentioned earlier the benefit, one of the big benefits for your business owner clients is having complete control uh, over the policy. With an executive bonus, most of that control is, is given up. There's also no cost recovery option um, at death. So in this plan, the employer pays additional compensation to the executive, either in cash or directly as a premium on the life insurance policy. This additional pay is included in the executive's W-2 and is taxable. Uh, the result is employer provided life insurance owned by the executive and ultimately benefiting the executive's personally selected beneficiaries. So I have explained to you uh, the what, the why, and some types of NQEB. So now I'm going to turn it over to my friend Dave Reynolds for a, re a real life example, and then I'll rejoin for a case study. All righty. Well, this, this, I'm using this example because going into it, it was against everything I ever liked to do. Uh, a young agent asked me to go present a deferred comp plan to a group of physicians in northern Mississippi. I, I share this because typically working with physicians, in my experience, is they think they know more than us. And they're also, they usually have a guy or a gal that they want to include. Uh, and this group also had another layer was the the practice was owned by a hospital. They wanted me to present a deferred comp plan to them. Went down there, went over basically everything Bill just covered from a 409 true deferred comp to split dollar, 401k over plan, 162 bonus, but they locked into the SERP plan. So we went through this presentation. Of course, two of the doctors didn't make the first meeting, so we had to come back down and present to those two. Uh, it was six physicians and a business manager. Fortunately, this business manager was pretty strong and could get things done. But after we convinced them this was the way to go, then we had to go to the hospital board and present to them. Um, that went pretty smoothly. The hospital knew these doctors were desperately trying to come up with some sort of deferred comp option. So, you know, we, we ended up writing this case. Uh, and the agent, who was a young agent, this changed his life, made a couple hundred thousand dollars in commission on this case. But when we went back, I went back with them to deliver the policies. One of the doctors said, hey, I own a bank. Would you guys be interested in presenting something like this to, to our bank? Well, of course, we went back and we presented boldly to the bank. And this young agent, who probably had been in the business a couple of years, ended, writing a, ended up writing a $10 million boldly case on this bank that this guy owned in rural North, northern Mississippi. So from a case that the whole way down there, when we were going to the first meeting, I was telling them, this, don't get excited. These things don't work. Doctors are tough to work with. Uh, the chance of us closing this is very slim. Turned out to be one of the biggest cases, you know, I've been involved in. So I, I tell you that story with just that if you have a relationship with a business owner or the head of a, a professional corporation, use one of us use Bill Crane and his team or one of your RVPs and we'll help you push this thing across the goal line. Bill, I hope that made sense. Back to you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. Um, great, great to hear those real life examples that, that you're involved in. It's very helpful. I'm going to now, um, you know, take a SERP, a SERP case and, and show you how it looks, at least from an illustration. Uh, perspective. And in this uh, example, we're going to use our, our global accumulator 
product. So it's important to, to, to talk about product briefly. Uh, you know, any, any IUL product uh, can work to fund these plans. You know, in fact, life insurance is not even the only option. Um, many plans are, are funded by investments, mutual funds, um, low risk, lower risk in, in investments. Um, but you do not have all the, the benefits of, of life insurance, some of the tax benefits, as well as that cost recovery option that, that we talked about in such a critical aspect uh, to this. But as far as using one of our products, if you're working with Global Atlantic, our retail products work well, and that's what I decided to, to show here, uh, especially if you only have one or, say, two lives, uh, and you're going to have your client go through full underwriting. Uh, our, our global accumulator product, uh, as well as lifetime builder product, can work very well. Um, but we do, as I mentioned, have a product and a program designed for, uh, for Coley, um, and, and probably a better uh, name for it is multi-life Coley. That program is really focused on multi-life. And so if, if you do have a midsize or larger business where you want to insure 5, 10, 20, um, we have cases with over 400 employees, uh, then you want to look at that, that other product, which comes along with uh, simplified issue and guaranteed issue underwriting. So that's another component to this. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but that is is available if you have have numerous employees that want to be covered as part of a, a large plan. Um, you certainly want to look at guaranteed issue um, to make the process much easier for for your clients. Uh, we also do work uh, with third party administrators as well to help you administer those plans. So let's jump into this one. This is a single life case, a 45 year old female executive. Uh, healthy. We have her uh, at preferred. She's in a 24% uh, tax rate. So she's uh, she's been a great employee. She's helped build the business, been very successful, and uh, and they want to reward her in a smart way. So they have offered her a defined benefits uh, SERP. We made this pretty simple. $100,000 uh, of, of cash for 15 years once she retires. She's planning to retire at 65 and from 65 to 80, they're going to pay her $100,000 per year, assuming that she meets some of the vesting requirements that would be included in a legal agreement between the employer and the executive. Uh, they decided here to purchase a $2 million policy. They're going to pay $50,000 into this for seven years. So a total of $350,000. That would be the extent of, of their cost, assuming that this plan plays out as designed. Always important to run stress tests and, and understand what the plan looks like if the market returns are, are lower than, than, than plans. So it's certainly something to, to look at, make sure your clients understand the risk. Uh, the employer, of course, is it's a C Corp. They have that nice low 21% tax rate, which uh, our businesses in the United States have enjoyed for the last uh, few years. And here we're looking at the global accumulator, IUL, the smart buy performance at 6.4% illustrated rate. So here we see the uh, this typical uh, format of our, of our illustration. I have here the first 10 years uh, of the policy. Uh, you see that the company is putting in $50,000 a year for seven years. That's on this policy. It's it's right around max funding. I wanted to use round numbers, but it's very close to, to max funding that policy. Non-MEC, important not to MEC these policies um, since distributions will be taken out of them. Uh, and those policies will go in, or the, the, I'm sorry, the premiums will go in for seven years. And here you see it's a level $2 million benefit just to have nice, simple round numbers. We move ahead to years 21 through 30. So these are important years. This is when uh, the, empo the employee, the executive reaches retirement age, and then we need to start kicking in the distributions from the policy. So you may recall from a couple slides ago that the benefit would be uh, $100,000 per year for this employee for 15 years. 
here you see us taking out $79,000 per year out of the policy. So why is that? Well, the employer will be able to uh, deduct um, uh, this benefit that's paid out to the employee. They have a 21% uh, tax rate, so it'll be a deduction of that 21%. So all that is required to take out of the policy is $79,000 um, because they'll be able to write off that that other 21,000. Um, so um, that's important to keep in mind when you're designing these for your client that there is a tax deduction. So obviously um, taking out $79,000 instead of $100,000 will help uh, this policy um, maintain a strength in accumulation and, and hopefully last uh, undisturbed for the entire length of the plan. You see the, the death benefit will decrease um, to some extent over there on the uh, the far right column in the non-guaranteed rates. Hey Bill, are the, um, so the distributions are uh, tax deductible. Are the premiums paid from the, for the employer tax deductible as well? No, the premiums are, are not tax deductible uh, for employers. However, the, the, the death benefit is tax free. So that's where the, you know, one of the tax benefits comes in. You're not going to be able to deduct that $50,000 going into the policy. We get that question a lot. So I'm glad you brought it up, Kyle. Um, but when that uh, death benefit is paid out to the company, that will be tax-free to, to the company. Um, and also then separately from the policy, that $100,000 that is paid out to the employee in retirement is deductible as well. So that's why we're only taking out the $79,000. So now we have up here our supplemental illustration uh, page, which, uh, which shows how the SERP works. Uh, this is available to all of you in our illustration software. There are actually multiple reports that can help analyze a SERP. I thought this one was the most straightforward for you to learn this concept from. So that's why I chose this one. So here um, we see again the first 10 years of uh, the, the policy. Uh, we see the corporation putting in $50,000 a year, a year for seven years uh, with a total of $350,000 um, going into the policy. In column three, we, um, we see again what is the cost to the company. It's uh, ultimately $350,000 once all the money is put into the policy. Number four, column four, that refers to the cost of this plan for the employer, uh, meaning what they have to pay out to the employee. So a little bit different, not what's going into the policy, but what they have to pay out to the employee. So for these first 10 years of the policy, it's, it's zero um, because the client or the employee has to vest. And once she hits retirement then and she's vested, then they'll be on the hook um, for $1.5 million to pay out to her over those 15 years of, of retirement. So when I move forward in the, in the slides, you'll see that that will start to fill in uh, with some numbers. So again, total uh, uh, number five is the total of three, column three and four. So we're at $350,000. We see our death benefit in column six at $2 million. And uh, the last column there, that six minus five, that shows that cost recovery that that I've been talking about. Um, so, you know, if the client would die in year 10, the company has put $350,000 into the policy. Um, they don't owe her anything, at least under this plan. Under most plans, they probably would have some sort of pre-retirement benefit. Um, but for simplicity, here they don't owe her anything. Um, they receive a $2 million death benefit, so their net gain here is $1.65 million. So this is for illustrative purposes. Um, you know, certainly your client wouldn't, wouldn't be banking on, on this kind of gain. Um, they wouldn't want the client, obviously, um, you know, to, uh, to not be available. But in the event of an untimely death, you know, they would, they would have that, that, that coverage. Um, let's move on to later years. All right, so we're going out to year 26 of the policy, and, and at this point, um, the client is age 70. We see um, here ages 70 through 80. So 
the five years before they've been paying out that hundred thousand um, dollars to the to the employee. So now we see years five through fifteen of this plan pay play out. So let's go through this. In um, in column one, there we see the amount um, to the company. Uh, again, this the tax deduction is factored in here, so that's why you're seeing seventy nine thousand dollars as the um, as the cost here because they're factoring in that that benefit. It normally would be a hundred a hundred thousand dollars if you're not factoring in the costs. Okay, uh, column three, we see that three hundred fifty thousand dollars the client the employer has not put in any further premiums into uh, the policy. In column four, we see what the, the cost is of this, um, of this plan. So here in, um, in year six of this plan, uh, or I'm sorry, in year 26 of the plan, um, which is the sixth year of retirement for the employee, at the top there of column four, the company is still going to owe $711,000. Uh, to her. So again, that factors in the the tax deduction that's available. Um, if you if you didn't factor in the tax deduction, it would be nine hundred thousand dollars. They've already paid out uh, six hundred. Now they owe nine hundred thousand. You factor in the tax deduction, and it's and it's to seven hundred eleven. So you see, as the years go by, um, that gets smaller and smaller as they pay out that money from the policy. So there, in year thirty five of the policy, when she's age eighty and the plan has been fulfilled, there is no uh, further um, cost to the company, no further expected cost to them. So in column five, we have simply adding that $350,000 to what the company would owe the employee. And if we look at, at year 35 there, again, at age 80, the cost to the company is $350,000. Everything's been paid out of the policy. All of the benefits have been paid out of the policy. And at that point, the company is just out of pocket $350,000. If the employee would die at age 80, once this plan has been fulfilled, there is a death benefit of $2.2 million approximately. And that factors in all of the loans that were taken out of it. So we see that death benefit being adjusted over the years as it takes into account the, um, the loans from the policy along with the interest credit and growth. So there in year 35, uh, it's a $2.2 million death benefit. Uh, with the resulting gain, if everything plays out properly, uh, $1.8 million, a $1.8 million gain there for the company after everything has played out. So this is a good summary of what the company can expect. Now, there's always considerations. Um, to think about with the with the, the clients, um, you, you know, again, this is very long term. We're talking here in this plan, 35 years out before they would have that 1.8 million dollar gain. Again, this is based on uh, non guaranteed numbers, um, so you would want the client to look at stress tests and see. Well, if the average rate of return is only four percent, what's this going to look like for me? I would highly suggest that. Um, also, you know, your client um, may think about the cost of money, right? They're, they're locking in this $350,000 for, for 35 years. So that certainly, you know, is a factor inflation, you know, the cost of money that could have invested and maybe had a better return. Um, all things just to, 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 to keep in mind. So they also could have invested in, in equities that, that, that dropped. Um, so, you know, a lot of positives here some considerations to discuss with your client. But I think at the end of the day, you see this as a, a great solution for those businesses that are in it for the long term, um, that have key executives, they can, they can provide a tremendous benefit at a pretty, in a pretty cost effective way uh, for the company, potentially, you know, even having a gain um, at the at the end of this in the long term. So hopefully this was a, a good summary um, for you. If you want uh, some more um, higher level information, um, make sure to tune in tomorrow um, for my colleague and friend, uh, Dave Graham, who's going to handle the 201 session. Uh, but for now, um, Dave and I are happy to take any questions that you have. I um, will hand it back over to Kyle for that process.
Yep. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Dave. Uh, we had several questions come in during that uh, Dave and Bill were able to answer. We have a couple more pending questions. If you'd like to ask a question, click on that Q&A box and uh, we'll have uh, our, our presenters answer those. Um, one question that we got in, Bill, uh, focused on the death benefit component of your example. Um, and the question was just kind of, you know, where does the death benefit go, you know, uh, both post and pre-retirement? So I guess maybe touch on kind of how, and then you, you mentioned it, but how you had this set up and maybe if there's any flexibility to kind of adjust that kind of based off need. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, to answer broadly um, with flexibility, yes, that, that is certainly one of the great benefits here. There's a lot of flexibility here um, because these are not qualified and they're not, um, you know, largely regulated by ERISA. There are some ERISA requirements, um, but there is a lot of flexibility here. The death benefit in, in most of these examples, so the first five types of, of plans, uh, where it's company owned, the company has full control over that death benefit. So they own the policy. They being the company are the beneficiary of the policy. So that death benefit is going to come to them. And so, you know, they can set it up um, however they'd like. If they want to share some of that death benefit with the employee, um, you know, during, um, uh, during employment or, or in retirement, they can do that. The best way to do that is through a split dollar agreement where the employee is getting taxed on that uh, economic benefit, that coverage, so that they can pass the death benefit tax free to, to the beneficiaries. Um, and, you know, in retirement, typically you have um, a set amount. So in our example, we had $1.5 million um, that was going to be paid out to this employee in retirement. And that would be paid out either to the employee if they survive to age 80 or to their beneficiaries. The, the company typically is on the hook for that no matter what, um, but then they recover it through that, that death benefit that's going to go to, to the company. Um, you know, company can either keep it, um, or if they wanted to, they could share it. If they wanted to provide additional benefit to the employee, they could share it to the, uh, with the beneficiaries as well. And those, those economic benefits, and that sounds kind of scary, Bill, but from a cost perspective, they're very reasonable because they're they're based off annual renewable term, correct? So, you know, though it sounds like it's daunting, it usually still makes sense in terms of they're paying a very, very minor cost to have a, a pretty nice portion of death benefit, something to happen them prematurely, correct? Exactly, exactly. It's the value of a term policy. So if, if the company wanted to provide term coverage for an employee, say a million dollars of term coverage, there's a formula to determine, well, what is the value of it? And so for somebody who's age 40, I'm just throwing a number out there, but say it's $300. Um, and so then that $300, um, the value of that policy would be added onto the client's W-2. And then they would pay, you know, 20, 30%, whatever their tax bracket is. Perfect. So I think we had some questions on last section where they were showing a, the example where the premium was, you know, the employee, the employer was paying a premium of fifty thousand so dollars. They were thinking they were going to get taxed on that full amount. It's just the portion for the term coverage. Correct, correct, right. So, so yeah, with a with a split dollar agreement, you know, in in this example, it's a two million dollar policy. The company is paying that fifty thousand dollars. That's not going to the employee um, because the company owns the policy, so no tax on that fifty thousand. And say the company wanted to um, endorse over 500,000 to the employee. They can do that, you know, say the value at age 45 of 500,000 is gonna be pretty cheap. So, you know, say three, $400 of, uh, of a benefit there for the employee goes on to her W-2, she pays taxes. And if she would die while still employed while that split dollar agreement is in place, that $500,000 would go tax-free to whoever she selected as a beneficiary. Uh, Bill, we got several questions and they kind of are asking the same thing. So um, maybe just, you know, briefly highlight again in your example from a, a tax deductible standpoint for the employee and the employer. Can you just touch on that, both the premiums paid and the dollars, you know, what's tax deductible, what's not in, you know, in perspective to the employee and the employer? Yeah. So what is, what is uh, taxable? Uh, and then tax to the employee 
and tax deductible to the employer is whatever amount is actually paid out to them. So again, the premium that's put into the policy, not tax deductible, um, also not taxable to the employee because it's not going to the employee, it's going into a policy owned by the employer. Once the employer starts paying out benefits to the employee, so in our example, $100,000 at age 65, uh, when that money is paid out to that employee, um, that is taxable to her as income, that $100,000. Um, that's the first time the employee would pay taxes uh, on, on this plan. And at that point, that $100,000 is tax deductible to the company. So, you know, think of these plans similar to the theories behind qualified, you know, plans with a 401k. Um, you set aside money, you're not taxed on it um, because you expect later in life to be in a, in a lower tax bracket. Uh, we'll see if that plays out, but the, you know that's one of the theories behind it. So same, same here. The employer or the employee, you know, sets aside, defers money, um, you know, either promise to them or, or promise to them later in retirement um, to receive that money later at a lower tax bracket. Great. And I think the last question that we had was just a, so you were showing loans in your example coming out. Um, is there any strategy between selecting a loan or a withdrawal? Do we ever see any situations where they decide to do a withdrawal compares to a loan, or is it, or is it normally a loan? It's going to depend on the product. Um, you know, for example, for those of you who are very familiar with our products, um, sometimes withdrawals will will work better on foundation than a than a than a loan. It, it's just going to depend on the circumstances and the risk tolerance for your for your clients. So you know, with our variable loans on Global Accumulator, that money does continue to earn interest crediting. There's a cap on that on that loan. So when I'm running this, um, you know, I'm very comfortable with the with the variable loan, and that's that's my preference. Um, now the client may prefer a fixed loan. Uh, or a withdrawal. There's there's no rule. It's it's really you know based on the product features, how the loans and withdrawals work, and what the client's preference is, you know based based on how those work. So if they're very conservative, um, maybe they don't want a, a a variable loan, and so the policy may not perform quite as well, at least as illustrated. Um, but your client has some comfort there. Um, so it's it's really a risk tolerance and a and a preference by your clients. Excellent. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, we got one in. Is this uh, is this plan only suitable for a C corp, uh, or how about uh, S corps? Does it work for those as well? It it does. It does. Yeah. Um, you know, C corp has really. There's been a lot of focus on it because of that. The the tax rates were slashed so low. So we've really gone out to try to promote this. Um, to C corps, and you'll continue to see that if you're if you follow our marketing, is to uh, you know this is just a great opportunity for C corps who now have a lot more cash, um, who want to retain that to put it into into life insurance. So that's why I highlighted that at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, but yes, S corps also you know receive some tax benefits um, from that law that was passed at the end of 2017, and so they may have some extra cash. And yes, these plans uh, can be just as effective for S corporations. They are certainly not exclusive for C corps. Great. Well, I think that we, we we've gotten to all the questions. Uh, reminder to all the attendees, we will be sending out a copy of the presentation along with uh, a link to the recording. So if you'd like to check back, use that for, uh, you know, check back on some notes, or if you have someone in the office who wasn't able to join us, you think could benefit from this, um, you know, feel free to distribute that to them. Uh, and, and I just want to also reiterate too, you know, Dave made the point when he was kind of talking about his real life experience with these type of plans. You have a fully staffed, fully capable team here at Global Atlantic to help you with these things. Uh, reach out to Bill, reach out to his team members. A lot of great expertise and knowledge around uh, case design, you know, questions that you should ask these business owners, fact finding, 
and really implementation, as Dave mentioned, to help you push these type of cases past the uh, past the finish line. So utilize this team. They're excellent. They're great to work with. Um, and, you know, Dave mentioned you have a regional footprint as well, too, a representative from Global Atlantic that's assigned to you. Uh, let him or her know what's going on, and they can help you from start to finish. So definitely reach out to those people. We're here to help. Um, I, I want to thank Bill and want to thank Dave for their time. I thought this was excellent. I hope you guys uh, got a lot of great information. And, uh, you know, check back in with us tomorrow for a little bit deeper dive on the 201 section, which would be a great you know, transition from kind of covering the basics to, to uh, diving a little bit deeper. So check that out tomorrow, 3 p.m. Central Time. So thank you, everyone. We always appreciate the business. We appreciate the partnership. And let us know what we can do to help out. Have a great day.